Hi, this is Rob Johnson, President of the Institute for New Economic Thinking, back here for a third panel sponsored by INET in conjunction with Tito Fiore and a uh, wonderful Trento Economic Festival. As we say every day, we wish we were there in person, but that that's just not how the cards were dealt this year. As I've mentioned in the previous two sessions, INET has been building a Commission on Global Economic Transformation in these very difficult times. We had Mark Carney and Bill Janeway two days ago and yesterday, Giotti Ghosh, Rohit Medora, and Joseph Stiglitz. Today I have Michael Spence, the co-chair along with Joseph Stiglitz, two Nobel laureates, to talk about other elements of what our commission is focused on, which are the major challenges to transformation and disruption. I would say that uh, there is a context or a, or a stressful nature of unforeseen change that ignites fear, makes the temptation to authoritarian politics much greater than it might uh, otherwise be, and at the same time there's vast potential. The epigraph at the beginning of the movie on Netflix, Social Dilemma, about the big internet platforms and, and Silicon Valley, said, nothing vast enters the life of mortals without a curse. That is a quote from Sophocles. But I would also say that with that curse, you can't smother the vast potentials that are on the horizon. As Diana Ross from my home city of Detroit sings, do you know where you're going to? Do you like the things that life is showing you? Do you know? Well, we can't know, but the best thing we can do is bring somebody who is a deep diver, whether it's relationship between technology an economy and labor or technology and new forms of commerce or U.S.-China relationship. I don't know any better cleanup hitter than Michael Spence. And the only thing I'll tell our audience, I had an unintended export to Italy this year because between Mike Spence and Mark Carney, I've got two Ivy League graduate former hockey players. One is a goalie at Princeton or excuse me, a goalie at Harvard, Mark Carney, and Mike played hockey with Princeton University. So I don't know what the relationship, I grew up in Detroit and I love hockey, but I don't know what the relationship is between what we've exported and that sport. But I do know Mike will deliver a tremendous export today. And Mike, thanks for joining me. No, it's great to be with you, Rob. So Mike, when we've talked in preparation for this, we talked a lot about the what you might call precedents of past transformations and how this one, which just appears all around us. I mean, in recent years, financialization, the prospect of climate, concerns about migration, <clears throat> globalization, and whether the nation state can manage its affairs any longer. But the realm of technology, you've been working with the Luhan Academy, I've had the good fortune of doing a podcast with their leader, Chen Lung, recently about a report that you were involved in writing. But there are many aspects, biomedical science, gene editing, uh, the digital big data kind of issues, the issues of which might call relative power of factors of production. And you see them all, solar, DNA sequencing, all of these things how do they relate to the past and what kind of lessons can we draw from the past about all these things that are right on the horizon right now and both exciting and a little bit scary? Well, I guess, I guess um, I would say, Rob, you know, we live in a period where so many things are changing that I think virtually all of us at times feel somewhat bewildered. Uh, by it. And we certainly live in a period in which, you know, making accurate forecasts about where we're going, especially long-term ones, I think are really unrealistically um, out of reach for us. Um, and that is anxiety producing uh, for everybody uh, because there are some, you know, significant challenges and downside risks. 
I would say, as uh, a sort of second point is, I was struck by, by looking recently at the, at the power of the tools that are being made available by science and technology. So I looked at solar, which 10 years ago was basically a nice idea, but relatively you know, useless uh, from a cost point of view in dealing with climate change. And now it's you know, at least competitive and by some standards better than the fossil fuel alternatives uh, and other alternatives like nuclear. I mean, the only thing that really beats it is sort of hydropower, and, uh, and, and that is important but has limited uses. And then I looked at, uh, you know, 50 years ago, roughly, uh, the structure of DNA was discovered, and about 30 or 25 years ago, we sequenced the first genome, probably cost a million dollars to get that done. And now the costs are so low that it's uh, you know become a very powerful tool in biomedical science, um, and similar things are occurring on the digital side. So you know the, what I think you know what I'm trying to say is when you look into the future, sometimes you can see these things coming, but we're at a point where they're actually with us, right? Uh, we we I picked biomedical science um, as an example, even though we're are formally going to spend most of our time on digital because this is very, very powerful, uh, uh, powerful stuff. And in particular, gene editing is an excellent example. The two women who received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry um, this past year in 2020 received the award for doing the foundational work that has enabled us to do gene editing. Gene, gene editing is a classic example of a technology that has enormous potential with respect to something that everybody cares about deeply, which is human health. Um, and on the other hand, it has potential misuses that are genuinely terrifying um, as well. So, so, we, so we've got very powerful tools that are available that are going to change uh, the opportunity set for our lives. You know, I recently wrote something with James Manika that said, we think, at least in the digital area, Area that the tools are now accessible enough and powerful enough, and the willingness to adopt and use them, partly as a result of the pandemic, has been accelerated so much that we may have another pro burst of productivity, um, and 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 productivity enabled growth as well. Um, so that's kind of the plus side, and I think you know there are lots of other dimensions of it that will that will explore. But but the main point is with all with anything this powerful. Um, that's changing our economies, our societies, the way we interact with each other, governance, and so on, comes huge opportunity and challenge at the same time. They're all double-edged swords. Yeah, people I know uh, who are studying Africa are of two minds. One is the ability to integrate a market and create opportunity where none existed before with these mm -hmm. new digital platforms. Some concern about how to get the capital raised to install the digital platforms, mm -hmm. but the potential is on the horizon. Mm -hmm. Others are very concerned about how essentially replacing human beings will exacerbate inequality, weakening labor relative to the owners of these platforms in whatever context, but particularly in places like Africa, where the income and wealth inequality is quite extreme. So there seems to be, uh, how would I say, visions of dread and visions of progress, how would I say, on the same screen at the same time in almost mm -hmm. all of these places. And yeah. The question becomes: How do we manage it as human beings? How do we right. govern? Well, that's a, that's a hugely challenging question. So, you know, for the festival this year is about the return of the state. So, we, we certainly don't take you know take take this on by ta by adopting a hands off approach. So we just simply can't. Uh, um, we, we you know we're going to have to sort of step up to it and make. Uh, value-based collective choices um, that try to carry us through these things that mitigate the downside risks and, and um, amplify the opportunities. But, but, but let me say one more thing about digital. So, we, you know, you asked about the past. Uh, we had the Industrial Revolution that began in Britain, spread to continental Europe, uh, spread around the world uh, eventually, uh, but really didn't make it to the developing countries until the, the post-war period. 
Industrial Revolution had lots of uh, mechanization, right? We would probably use the term automation now, but it isn't quite right because these machines weren't autonomous. Um, they were, you know, in control of human beings. They augmented human beings, and human beings' jobs changed enormously. Um, I think you, 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 the machines replaced human muscle. Right. Uh, the digital technologies, in, in particular the programmable computer and networks and all the other things that, that we don't have to list here, um, are, are basically uh, entering the world of information, coordination, decision-making, transactions that up till the digital era were essentially, and there were a few exceptions, uh, entirely in the hands of human beings. We, if, if you put that in sort of popular jargon, at least the way we use it in the United States, we, we are experiencing both automation and augmentation in the, the world of white-collar work, uh, really, for the first time. Um, and maybe the effects there are bigger. Um, they're not confined to that. I mean, we have now, with artificial intelligence and sensors, we have robots that are really are relatively autonomous and do replace human beings in sort of manufacturing, logistics, um, and so on. But we've got, you know, uh, tons of jobs, um, even without the most advanced digital sort of machine learning technology, tons of jobs being eliminated from economies um, in the white collar area because the machines do them faster, better, and sometimes with great accuracy as well. So I think that puts us, you know, in a, in a in, in, on a trajectory that's really different than anything that we've experienced before. So, you know, if we look at the Industrial Revolution, we, we say jobs changed, but they didn't disappear. Machines got took control of the jobs, acquired new skills, and so on. Um, and maybe that'll happen again. We can't reject that hypothesis. But the point is that we now have machines doing something that humans uniquely did up to about 50 years ago. So I guess we got to wait and see whether they'll replace poets with imagination, but other than that. Uh, <laughs> Highly unlikely. Yes. Highly unlikely. But, uh, but there are, there are uh, how do I say, tremendous learning curves from automated uh, machines. And uh, right. even just in these last few years, you've seen them beat world champions at chess and things like that. So. Uh, there clearly are dimensions of mind that are being challenged. One of the things I find fascinating is the difference between a technology being introduced to create what couldn't be done before and a technology being introduced to perhaps make more efficient, less costly, something that was done before. You've done a lot of work in China. Yep. The, the growth of mobile financial platforms and fintech it, with, with U.S. banking and branches and so forth, I can see that displacement factor being very large in relation to the, how do I say, creating new opportunities. They may cost less or what have you. But in China, I would imagine it's such a big country that you've probably seen both. Oh, absolutely. What, yeah. Let me take the e-commerce side of that first. These are based on studies that have been done by the Luan Academy, which is uh, located in Hangzhou and sponsored by Jack Ma and, and, and has access to the Alibaba and, and Ant Financial Alipay data, um, which, which is an enormous uh, collection of data given the progress that the Chinese have made in, in um, that aspect of the digital economy. And what, what those studies show is that in e-commerce, you see both patterns. Uh, you see uh, e-commerce displacing retail, where retail was well-developed to some extent, as well as augmenting them. So you see both. And where, where would that be? It would be in places like Shanghai, where retail was well-developed before the e-commerce really, really uh, took off. Um, and then you look at third and fourth tier cities, they do in the studies, and, and agricultural areas, particularly ones that are relatively remote, and e-commerce is providing a set of uh, opportunities, options, and services that you know weren't there before. It's not displacing anything. Um, now, eventually, you know, it will. They'll all. They'll look similar, right? The the, on, the offline retail will develop. It will be coordinated with the online retail or so-called omni-channel. 
Um, so it's not a permanent condition, but in terms of inclusive growth patterns, um, you know, you see something pretty impressive. You know, half the entrepreneurs on Taobao, uh, roughly 5 million, are women of the 10 million, uh, and so on. So you see these patterns. And on the, on, the, uh, on the big data side, you see something quite impressive, although, it, it, you know, they've got to figure out how to regulate it. Um, and that is with very large amounts of data, and, all, and very large numbers of people using the mobile payment system, they have data on people who are otherwise relatively anonymous to the, um, to the financial system, meaning they don't have collateral, they can't really borrow, it's too expensive, you know, in the traditional channels for banks to kind of deal with them. Um, but the machine learning algorithms um, can do a pretty good job of credit scoring and pricing credit. Um, and so that's starting to develop very rapidly. There's an entity called MyBank that's an offshoot of, uh, of this process of Amp Financial and some other entities. Um, and they're lending to, you know, to individuals, to households, and to small businesses with five or fewer employees that were more or less cut off from credit or the credit they could access was highly inefficiently and sort of extractively provided. It was kind of... Uh, almost loan sharks, I guess is the way I would say it. So, so once again, you see a sort of, on the upside potential, you see an inclusive uh, potential growth pattern emerging from these things. And you see it in other areas. I mean, I don't want to be long-winded, but there's lots of applications now of, um, of things like image recognition in healthcare um, that are providing primary care diagnostic um, uh, opportunities with respect to things like skin cancer, um, or, or diabetic retinopathy uh, that, um, that were essentially unavailable to very large fractions of the world's population because they don't ne live near ophthalmologists or dermatologists. Um, and I think sometimes when we get, you know, sort of smitten with all the challenges that we face, and they're real, for sure, Do we, are we going to have enough jobs? Is the income distribution going to be okay? Um, you know, do we have any reasonable way of dealing with cybersecurity? There may be a tendency to forget these huge upside opportunities as well. Yeah. Well, you mentioned uh, the Luhan Academy. I know you were part of a report that was uh, released in early February called Data Calculus in the Digital Era. Mm -hmm. uh, number of both uh, Asian and Western economists. I know Eric Maskin, Chris... Pissarides, Bank Holmstrom, yourself, and others were there, and, and I had the good fortune of making a podcast with Chen Long about this report. Right. And it seems to me that there are a number of, which my, I call dilemmas, embedded in this. The yep. big data can allow, I was involved in a conversation years ago with the Federal Reserve about taking data kept anonymous and aggregated but by county, by state, by region, by congressional district, the Federal Reserve could see in 72 hours what was happening in the business cycle rather than waiting six weeks for the next employment report. That's and right. so the, what you might call the duration of being off course was diminished greatly. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, there's no question. So there's a lot of potential improvement, a lot of mm -hmm. ways in which we can serve society better. But then there's also this angst that's related to surveillance and related to, how do I say, I can't remember the adage, but something like in some of these mobile platforms, you are the product. In other words, <laughs> you get a free service for being the product. Right. And, and then the question comes, as you and I've talked about in many instances, if you have economic platforms that also give off big data, which creates opportunity for surveillance, how can places like the United States and China collaborate when hackers are so good at penetrating systems and at hiding their identity? Yeah. How could the United States and China make an agreement to work together but maintain the faith <coughs> with that both sides are complying and playing in good faith when hackers from everywhere can pretend 
They're either Americans attacking the Chinese system or the Chinese attacking the American system. Yeah. How do we how do we how do we overcome that? How do we overcome things like ransomware? <coughs> Is this where we need well, to uh, to evolve? We might call it as a new dimension of what these technologies have revealed for the next step. Yeah. I mean, it's it's ironic that you know we, this comes up in the context of a pandemic where the ability of the economy to function increasingly on a digital foundation has made. And made economies resilient um, in a way that they just simply wouldn't have been before. Or to put it differently, the economies would have had to continue function at enormous cost in terms of health um, because you just can't shut them down. You can partly shut them down, and we did, with significant costs, both to the economy and to lots of individuals, uh, and we have to fix that. Um, but uh, but you're right. I mean, so I guess I would phrase it, it's not just the platforms. We, you know, the entire economy uh, is being built on digital foundations pretty much everywhere. And this creates vulnerabilities that we, we haven't addressed. Um, it, and and in, in particular, you know, if you are operating on a, a digital platform and it's vulnerable in a whole variety of ways to, to attack, ransomware being an example, um, which is an attack on data, right? Um, then, I mean, or the accessibility of data, and but the, you know, in principle, you could have attack that, you know, that destroys data um, and makes it very difficult to kind of get the, the system up and running. And so, so the, the, one of the puzzles is, you know, if we've, it's, this is not a new idea, although it gets more serious as the extent of the digital underpinnings of the economy continue to increase. Um, but the question is, what you know, what are we doing about it? I think, given the subject of the festival this year, we have, uh, you know, excessively weak thus far activity in regulatory activity with respect to sort of, uh, di you know, security, digital security, uh, which isn't just international, by the way. I mean, you can attack things from within. As you pointed out, you can attack them from pretty much anywhere if you're good enough. Um, this is a role of the state. Uh, you know, I, I'm quite sure private sector incentives are not sufficiently strong um, to to create the kinds of security that we need. In part because there's huge externalities. You know, I mean, <laughs> we just had a pipeline taken down in the United States, which caused all kinds of problems. That was a ransomware attack. The, the latest one was, you know, uh, a, a supplier of beef. I mean. You might say, well, who cares? But, I mean, you know, the next one could be the electric grid in the Northeast or, you know, in uh, in Germany or something like that. So so I think, you know, this is um, both domestically and internationally extremely high priority that hasn't been addressed so far. Uh, now, when it gets addressed, you know, the question is, you know, is there are there defense mechanisms? You know, there's offense and defense. Who's going to win? Um, we don't. At least I don't know the answer to that. Maybe the experts do, but if they do, they haven't made it very clear. Uh, but in the meantime, I think we just have you know inattention to the the problem. I mean, let me give one final example. The inter the Internet of Things has been used to in denial of service attacks. What are they? That, that basically you, you bombard a website that's you know used at high volume with so much volume that you bring it down, that it can't function. This has happened to Facebook and a number of other mega platforms. Um, <laughs> but you essentially, you, cr you create fake um, users of the internet and they all address the same um, servers at the same time. Now, maybe cloud computing makes this a little easier to withstand, I don't know. Um, it certainly helps solve the peak load problem, but, uh, if the Internet of Things consists largely, up until now, of things that, unlike computers and, pho and phones, um, don't have really any security built into them. So they're very easy to hack and use in denial of service attacks. What we need, of course, is regulation that says you don't get to sell, you know, uh, video cameras, little things that you use in your refrigerator and whatnot. Um, that don't have any security built in them. It's just an example. So what, if we get that problem addressed properly, then I think there is an important agenda, um, international agenda, 
um, to, to try to deal with the, the same set of issues, but on a kind of cross-border basis for, for the reason you mentioned. You know, the hackers can fake where it's coming from. And I think, you know, people talk about these, uh, the new word that's so widely used is resilience. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm tempted to ask our uh, subcommittee chair on climate transformation, Adair Turner, mm -hmm. how much energy do these digital platforms consume? <laughs> and if we're going to make, I don't know, semiconductor technology evolve, do they have to be retooled? so as not to have the adverse side effects vis-a-vis -vis energy consumption. And I'm also concerned in the realm of resilience about whether this semiconductor technology where people say that, and you've said it yourself to me, that the cutting edge is now in Taiwan. How does that play into U.S.-China relations? Well, yeah, but so the cutting. I mean, so what, what what's happening as as I understand it in the semiconductor world is that they're trying to make the distances between the circuits smaller and smaller. And when and when they're able to do that, which it's very hard to do, when they're able to do that, it reduces the um, increases the speed um, of the semiconductors in doing whatever they're supposed to do, and it reduces the energy consumption. Hmm. Um, so. You know, the scale keeps coming down, uh, but my understanding is that some of the smallest scales, like four nano, whatever they are, um, are being produced mainly uh, in Taiwan by TSMC. Uh, and, it, and, 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 and I've also been told, although I, I won't report this as authoritative, that, that those scales make a huge difference in the energy consumption, which is enormous of the big data centers, you know, the, the big server centers uh, that that run the cloud computing systems that eventually we're all going to end up using. Um, so so in all kinds of ways, Taiwan has become a kind of very strategic property in the digital world. Mm -hmm. It's also quite obviously, by many uh, accounts of experts in international relations, one of the most you know, dangerous places with respect to the China and the U.S. because China claims it as part of China, um, and 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 it may get fed up, you know, with the sort of long game of waiting, uh, or see that the winds are blowing against them, and and if uh, if they decide to aggressively address that problem from the point of view of taking over. Um, Taiwan, there will be all kinds of trouble. Uh, so, uh, I, who knows whether semiconductors are an incentive, but uh, they're important. The big, big data center, we, this is creeping up on us, uh, but big data centers and things like Bitcoin, which are very, very computational and network intensive activities, um, are major consumers of energy um, going forward. So part of the climate change agenda is minimizing that, which means further progress in the semiconductor area. And when you look at, uh, how would I say, one of, one, of, one of the things that we've studied in the Global Commission is the scenarios that places like the International Office of Migration present that essentially... Mm -hmm. 55 years from now, there'll be more than 5 billion people in Africa. Mm -hmm. You're very knowledgeable about development. You ran the Growth Commission at the World Bank. But at some level, can past be prologue when in underdeveloped countries in the global south, in equatorial regions, carbon burning and rise in temperature can destroy subsistence farming, create a form mm -hmm. of shock that's a frame of, how do you say, a contributor to social unrest. At the same time, we don't have the East Asian model of development anymore. Global supply chains, machine learning and automation. There's, uh, how, how would I say, we don't have the playbook for development with a growing population that will lose 
at least some significant proportion of its subsistence farming. But I know from our conversations, you've been quite hopeful about some of what digital can do for Africa. Mm -hmm. share, share with us how you see an unprecedented development strategy that okay. probably involves solar and involves digital. Uh, can yeah, no, on the, on the, yeah, oh gosh. Um, so I guess the starting point is, you know, many African countries have made significant progress. There, there are, you know, there are setbacks, but there are setbacks everywhere. When you, when you look carefully, um, you can see that in Latin America now, where, you know, you get forward progress, but, you know, then some real challenges come up. Um, second, um, and, you know, given the post-war period, Africa has kind of fallen behind in many, many dimensions on average. Um, it's an unusually configured continent because there are more landlocked countries, um, and there's a lot of natural resource wealth, which is um, an asset, but it's difficult to manage. And if managed poorly, it leads to conflict and uh, dysfunction rather than uh, than enhanced ability to invest and grow. Uh, you know, right now, you and I have talked about this. There's lots of uh, investment opportunities in Africa, but the risk premia are pretty high. And so we have, again, a role for government and international institutions um, to try to sort of overcome this. And a good example is the one you just mentioned, which is if there's any continent that ought to be sort of planning in the future to run on um, a substantial chunk of, um, of electricity generation with solar, it would be Africa. It spans the equator and so on. Um, and But right now, the progress on that front is at least a question mark because of the you know, investment incentives, costs of capital, risk premium, and other things that, that, need, that need to be addressed to sort of overcome that. Um, mm -hmm. in, in the meanwhile, I think, you know, the, the experts in climate change have said clearly that some parts of the world are going to be, ad, you know, adversely affected more than others, and that some of the sub-Saharan countries um, in Africa, to the extent climate change, you know, uh, takes hold and, and continues to be a, a, an expanding problem, um, then we can expect, you know, r real trouble there, and that raises the migration issue and so on. I mean, on the digital side, I would say um, the bad news is that the, the so a, a, a good development model, it does two things. One, it leverages the global economy's technology and demand um, and, and allows countries to specialize on the tradable side and, and sort of bring people in uh, to the sort of more modern sort of manufacturing urban sector of, of the, the growing urban sector of the economy. And that kind of jump starts the growth process. Uh, and, and the second thing is it's important, if this is going to really work, that those be powerful employment engines. So the Asian development model had all of the above, right? It starts with textiles and apparel, and then you assemble other stuff, including electronics, eventually. You're selling to a big global economy. You can, you, because of the low cost of labor, you have a comparative advantage. And, and it employs tons of people, draws them out of the traditional sectors where there's um, surplus or underemployed labor. Uh, and that model was used in countries sequentially, starting with Japan, um, through uh, a good part of the world, especially in Asia. And uh, the, the negative side of the digital revolution is that, the, that robotics, powered by artificial intelligence and enhanced sensors, uh, things like image recognition. I mean, the robots can see, um, I mean, put it crudely, um, in a way that wasn't possible before, and which means that they can start to displace human labor in doing labor-intensive things like assembly, electronics, uh, or this hasn't really happened yet. Textiles and apparel is a big challenge <laughs> for automation, but I don't think it's a reasonable bet most people wouldn't want to bet that it, it's a challenge that won't be solved, um, which means that the Asian development model in that specific form, right, labor-intensive, you know, uh, manufacturing, assembly, and so on, is going to lose its power 
uh, at just the point where the, the handoff looks like it would come, you know, from East Asia to South Asia and Bangladesh, maybe some in India to some of the poorer African countries. And so the question is, what's the, is there an alternative that is, that has those characteristics, you know, you'd leverage global technology and demand and, and, and have big, powerful employment engines. And I think the honest answer is we don't know. I mean, I'm, I don't think anybody's sure there's an alternative. On the positive side, um, you can um, include a lot more people in the economy, create a lot of entrepreneurial um, activity and so on uh, within a country using the digital platforms. Um, because the, of the low cost of entry, um, the fact that you know you can overcome challenges associated with distance and so on so easily with digital technology, provided you have the infrastructure. Um, and by infrastructure, I mean, most people are going to connect to this, you know, using the mobile internet, which is a little more than 15 years old, but not much. People forget how, <laughs> or I forget, uh, how little time it's taken for the mobile internet to essentially spread throughout the world. Uh, but it's, you still need the, the, the underlying structure. You need the speed. Uh, or it's or it's uh, connectivity, but not terribly, terribly useful for things like online commerce, uh, education, and other things that can be useful. But there is potential there for sure. A lot of people are concerned about globalization. Mm -hmm. The kind of how I say hip pocket joke is the Treaty of Westphalia is dead. Mm -hmm. that you can have models as economists of all the things you would do to keep things on track, ameliorate uh, distress or extreme imbalances. But in a world where finance can be transferred in nanoseconds, where people are resistant because they're not just factors of production, they're citizens who have social customs and histories and so forth, and uh, large-scale migration can frighten other people, that, their, that mm -hmm. their platform is being changed. So we have a situation where the integration that digital provides for us is both very positive. Someone who's a fashion designer in India can mm -hmm. reach markets all over the world yeah. But, the, but there's also a sense in which things can escape. Now, in the old days, people talked about foreign direct investment in places where there were no labor laws or foreign direct investment in places where there was no climate protection. But it does seem that finance and technology are relatively stronger than people in this global system. And the name of this conference is the return of the state. Mm-hmm. How do you envision the state returning? And there's so many levels. There's the level of everything is under one tent, global governance. Then there's, but how sensitive are they to the stresses and pains in any given area? Then there's local governance. But you and I can identify what's wrong if we're the mayor, but we can't stop it if it's the cross current of many global forces. In your mind, how do you how are you seeing the return of the state, the role of governance, in the context of the technologies and systems that we do have? Um, so I, I mean, I think you know the return of the state is um, several things. First of all, it, you know, there's an enhanced understanding um, that the state is absolutely crucial uh, in dealing with with challenges, anxieties, things that really matter to people. Um, it's the social insurer, you know, it's the fixer of kind of market failures and so on, when it's working properly. And so what, what I anticipate, Rob, is modification of various aspects of globalization, including ones that have to do with digital technology and data flows. Um, to make to make sure to make the thing that people rely on, which is the nation state, state, <laughs> not global. I mean, I don't think there, I don't. I haven't heard anybody say that we're all going to feel comfortable being governed by a single, you know, you know, global government. 
when people talk about global governance, they're talking about, I think, mainly uh, institutions that facilitate cooperations among nation states and their sub-entities, uh, because that's what people turn to. I mean, you know, my, mm -hmm. my political science friends uh, uh, tell me constantly, all politics is local. Uh, I think that's probably true. So, so bottom line is, I think we will modify um, in various ways the inter, in, you know, interdependence um, to make nation states more powerful and, and more able to deliver um, what their citizens expect. Mm -hmm. So that means fragmentation of the internet. Uh, it may mean backing off in certain digital areas. It'll be modifying trade arrangements. Um, finance is more complicated, but you know, when I looked at the successful um, developing economies over the last 25, 30 years, and we asked the question, not wasn't just me, I mean, a whole group of people on that commission on development, growth and development, did they have totally open capital accounts? Uh, no, <laughs> right? Did they have totally open trade, or did they open them suddenly? No. Uh, you know, so I think we're in a period of, kind of what I would call useful subtlety that will push us in the direction of... Uh, limiting, to some extent, extreme forms of interdependence. Now, having said that, the, you know, we, we, with, with things like climate change or global health challenges, uh, we can't carry that to an extreme, right? We can't just kind of shut down and say, we didn't like that world, you know, where uh, people felt, you know, a loss of power and control over their lives via their governance structures, because we have to cooperate in those areas. But I think the direction of movement will be um, reducing challenging volatility, creating job, destroying interdependence to some extent, interdependence to some extent, and then focusing on the areas that are absolutely crucial. Mm -hmm. Well, we do see a rise in uh, awareness. I attended a little bit of the sessions a couple of days back of the Green Swan Conference and the central bankers yep. uh, talking about uh, the need for international coordination, collaboration, and potentially financing. Christine Lagarde, Jay Paul, and others were quite uh, quite clear about this. Yep. Uh, I do see concern, and well, let me let me just go to the question. The G7 announced a minimum tax deal yesterday. How do you see that? Do you see that as a, what you might call, each nation is responsible, but there's a, there's a sort of teamwork that's being put in place so that people can't evade a threshold? And then the other question I'd ask is, should we be taxing companies or people? <laughs> that's a good question. Look, at, I mean, um, taxation issues, um, it, international, digital, you know, the fundamental questions, you know, do, do you tax, how do you tax um, services that are produced in five countries and consumed in two others inside a company, right? I don't know. <laughs> uh, there's very big challenges in that area. But to answer your question directly, um, I think what, um, what the G7 did, I gather it's in response to a suggestion that Secretary Yellen made, is, a, is, a, is an important step in the right direction. And if the G20 um, picks it up and goes along with it, that'll be 85% of the global GDP. And I can imagine a version of that actually getting implemented. And even though there'll be dissidents, you know, they're, if they're, they won't be that powerful. It'll be possible to implement it. And I think this, this, um, uh, destructive form of, com you know, tax competition for corporate activity uh, that has been characterized as a race to the bottom is is, is actually something that, that is usefully dealt with. Because the alternative, and I mean, there is an alternative, which is to tell your multinational corporations, you know, not to operate over there, uh, as opposed to pay a kind of fair tax to whatever jurisdiction you're in. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, in the end, you know, I don't know how to answer that. The last part: do, do corporations or people pay taxes? I mean, I guess 
in the end, uh, you know, people end up paying taxes, but uh, directly or indirectly. But uh, but there's an important set of issues that you know I think need to be dealt with, which is where do taxes? What are the? We know governments have to have revenue uh, in order to operate, so they have to they have to tax something. They can tax corporations, they can tax individuals, they can tax transactions, they can tax wealth. Uh, and you see just enormous differences, even across the OECD countries in, in, in those respects. And I think, you know, we're entering an era in which we'll ask important questions about, you know, it, given the objectives that we had, generating revenue for um, companies, dealing with um, fairly powerful trends in the direction of inequality. What are the best forms of taxation uh, that that allow for economic progress and dynamism on the one hand, but but uh, fund the government and deal with the inequalities on the other? You, you raise a number of interesting points, but one is where where people collect the tax. We might have an agreement, but. Do you pay to where your headquarters is? Do you pay where, to where your plant is or whatever? And Which brings me to a second dimension of this, which is there is an awful lot that these countries need to do collectively now with revenue, particularly as pertains to climate. Absolutely. Uh, you had mentioned earlier the high risk premiums in Africa. Mm -hmm. Well, the benefit of solar in Africa is not just to the African people. It's to your and my lungs, and mm -hmm. the quality of oxygen and the quality of the environment on planet Earth matters to us all. So if they're faced with a risk premium of 800 basis points, shouldn't we create the equivalent of revenue or guarantees or something to fund something that benefits the public good, meaning the global public good? And, there, in a, and I don't think it should be a competition between whether Germany pays or whether America pays or Canada pays. At some level, maybe these homogeneous floors on taxation create a pool of revenue that could be dedicated to those common causes. Yeah, no, I think that's it. I mean, ideally, that is exactly um, where you would want to go. Uh, and the question is, are we going to kind of get there? But that does mean, you know, I mean, we see this in Europe all the time. I mean, how much fiscal centralization, you know, do you really find acceptable? Um, but it, but there's no question. That, that, I mean, the the underlying argument is doesn't have a flaw, which is there's a collective interest that goes way beyond um, the citizens in a particular region for uh, for overcoming uh, obstacles like high risk premium and stuff. I don't have any doubt about that at all. Yeah. There's, a matter of fact, in this morning's uh, Financial Times, there's a, or the weekend edition, there's a report about how potentially rising inflation in the advanced countries will take what you might call the risk free rate higher as inflationary expectations start to rise a bit, and that that will add to the burden in many. Emerging economies, some of whom, uh, which my call, are, are on the cusp of debt re need for debt restructuring right now, so that they're. You yeah, mean because of the pandemic um, response? Yeah. Well, after no, the pandemic right. response and what have you, they have. How do they say these these countries, places like Argentina and what have you, didn't cause the pandemic, but their mm -hmm. revenue capacity diminished, which my call their their credit rating ratios deteriorated, and now the risk-free rate's getting pushed up as the advanced economies recover, which right. deepens yeah. their change. Well, it could, especially if they're, you know, out of balance on the, on the, on the capital account um, going, going in, then it could, it could make it dramatically worse fairly quickly, I guess is, is what I would say. Um, but I think, but I think your earlier point is right, which is that I think the general trend is people um, are not going to take, you know, what you might call full hyper globalization for granted anymore. 
and, and ask, how are we going to adapt to it? They're going to ask, how are we going to adapt globalization, you know, so that our national, local objectives based on values, human development, and so on are achievable uh, without uh, the risk of, you know, disra dis, uh, dramatic disruption. Mm -hmm. Mike, you mentioned a couple of times, and I think I did earlier on, the, the the Growth Commission. Mm -hmm. what, what are the five bullet points of wisdom that that long and deep process imparted to you? What do you conclude? What are the lessons of that mm -hmm. study? Well, uh, so they were. Uh, we tried to summarize it under five headings. So in, in, in virtually every country, we, we were focused on developing countries, but, you know, since we wrote that report <laughs> um, and, and thought about it, uh, but let me explain just for the audience what we were sure. doing. So that, that, that exercise was done. These are always progress reports. There is never a moment when you declare you know everything you want to know, ever, <laughs> okay? So the last kind of progress report, you know, that got a lot of attention was the, the um, Washington Consensus, um, kind of codified by John Williamson in 1989. You know, it was criticized for the name, but if you actually go look at it, I just recently wrote something about this is highly sensible. But there'd been 15 years, you know, and in those 15 years, China had grown dramatically. It wasn't clear that was going to happen. India had started their growth acceleration and a whole bunch of other things that happened in the developing world. So our job was to find out, based on experience, talking to experienced practitioners and serious researchers, what do we learn in that period that's useful to carry forward, you know, and that's kind of our interim report that try to be by useful. And, and what I took away from that, and what I think we tried to summarize is that there were five areas. I won't try to cover them all. The, I think John Williamson and the Washington Consensus were, were concerned about macroeconomic uh, instability uh, and failures on that front. There's been at least a significant improvement in that area, and that's there's no controversy whatsoever about the importance of that. The second one, I think, is one that, you know, we ought to listen to kind of pretty much every year, which is, you know, if you want to achieve your objectives, even if you're a poor country, you have to invest and save at high rates. And high rates means... 25 plus percent of GDP. You just can't grow, you know, at five, six, seven percent, you know, if you're invest, if you're under investing. And that means both public and private. The, the mix matters, and I won't bore you with the details. The third one is that, you know, on a standalone basis, if you don't have, if you're not connected to the global economy, whatever the risks and and challenges are associated with that, then you can't you can't achieve this kind of very rapid progress. So you've got to make your peace and do your the best you can dealing with the global economy because it gives you a big market and it gives you the demand I mentioned before. But the by far the and you can, you can't run a centrally planned economy. You need markets. That's not you know ne neoliberal fundamentalism, market fundamentalism, or nothing like that. You see all kinds of models, but all of them delegate some of the resource allocation um, to markets, prices, incentives, and so on. Uh, but the most important one is governance. I mean, if you ask yourself where, is the, where are the problems really coming from, uh, in a very large fraction of the cases, the answer is there's a governance problem. And a governance problem means whoever's in charge, I don't mean an individual, just, you know, but a group of people, if they're uh, not competent, if they're pursuing some objective that doesn't sound like the long-run public interest, um, then you get um, significant deviations from potential. I guess is a technical way to say it. Gover governance is just absolutely, absolutely crucial. And it seems, I guess, with the experience of the last four years in the United States, that some of those problems of governance can occur at the core of the system. And there's been, obviously, a great deal of concern, particularly after the pandemic, about, how would you say, the, 
distribution of the burden in this country or the deterioration of public schools where money that used to be called tax evasion is now tax avoidance and it's offshore. <laughs> and then we say, right. you know, we can't afford it. As the knowledge intensive economy grows and the human capital ladder that the American citizens can uh, climb is eroding. Yeah. And so I, I think it's, it's hard also using your lessons to understand what leadership looks like in a global system from a core nation. And I do believe the Biden administration has made substantial progress in trying to re-engender trust and setting a good example. Yeah. But uh, it's a formidable challenge. No, no, there's no question. I mean, and we, we you know, <laughs> as you said, we, you know, we, we, every country, and including the United States now, has had, had the experience of, you know, a kind of um, shaky period with respect to leadership. I, I think the ingredients are, uh, you know, they're not easy to define. It's not even easy to prove it matters, you know, from a social scientist point of view. But I think humility, um, uh, perseverance and dedication, um, you know, to the, uh, some version of it, the inclusive public interest, meaning bringing everybody along, um, and a willingness to recruit talent uh, and get the best the best talent you can, or, uh, you know, in government, uh, mm -hmm. in order to because nobody has all the answers. So you know, if, 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 if the, the great leaders are ones that that bring people in, bring people together, create a vision. It's different from where we happen to be going now. Um, get people kind of on board. It sounds mushy, but you know, I mean, if you go back to developing countries, Rob, and I'll, I'll let you wind up at this point because we're running out of time. You know, you, you can uh, countries are no one to stay in a in a low or no growth equilibrium for a long time. So it's not as if that's an unstable state. So the question is, if you all, if you, if over a fairly short period you move to a different trajectory, you know, where you're investing and saving and growing at let's call it six percent a year, or seven, where you're doubling the size of the economy every ten years, something fairly dramatic, in has to have happened with respect to people's expectations, you know, what they believe is going to go on in the economy and. And it's at least as I thought about it, you know, those are that's the critical role that leaders play. Um, they help people understand there's a, a different trajectory that's sufficiently believable that maybe we ought to give it a try. Well, Mike, uh, we've been talking about all of these challenges in the context of what's been rising political despair. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess I'll take my Detroit heritage and go back to Marvin Gaye's What's Going On, where in the third verse he says, we got to find a way to bring some understanding here today. And I would say I feel very fortunate at the Institute for New Economic Thinking to work with you and the other members of the Commission on Global Economic Transformation. And I do think we are in a place we're just pointing that the pain is insufficient. If we're going to bring this world to life for our children and grandchildren, we've got to show that there can be light at the end of the tunnel, alleviate some of that fear, and pull together. It requires a lot from the state and from political leaders. But Mike, leaders like you are making a great contribution. Thanks for being here, and thanks for working with us. Thanks, Rob. And um, thank you, Tito, for having us. Thank again you, Tito. At the festival. And hopefully next year we'll all be in the Opera House together. Right. Right. Thank you. Right. Bye-bye.